filming or I'm not even before, but just okay. like five days before we started filming. No, but the answer is no. Like you, you're always aspiring to, particularly when someone is as iconic as Stephen, so as well documented as him. Like you know, there are so many books. Whether you can read his science, you can read biographies, you can read James' book, you can talk to his students, all of which I did. You can then spend time with him. You can watch all the documentaries. But I don't think one ever quite knows. But the thing that was the key to me was when meeting him, having done all that work, and I just met him just a few days. Thank you. It's my toxic green juice. My <laughs> 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 like, oh, you're really in LA now. <laughs> um, but he has this amazing sense of humour and an amazing sense of mischief and this sort of like glint in his eye and that was that was like when I met him like the overriding quality that you know for all the other work that of the physicality and the, and the science you felt like that is his character it's his humor and his wit I mean the personality side like the wit side the humor I found that you know there was a lot of that in Anthony's script anyway and that was just something that was kind of fun to play with and Felicity and I would improvise around that and finding humor in the oddness and the, the moments particularly in some of them now, from I met maybe 30 or 40 people suffering from ALS in the process of preparing. And there was this one gentleman who came down having almost choked the night before, genuinely almost died the night before, and he came down the following morning. When I met him at the clinic, he, his wife described how he came down the following morning, and the first thing he said is, I wonder what death-defying act I can do again. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the idea of like, always finding like the, the humour in that one. So that was okay. Um, more complicated was <laughs> the brain side of it. you know. And I remember for months, my friends would be like, Dude, how are you going to play genius? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, so I've got in hand whilst not sleeping at night. Like, and I suddenly came to this sort of epiphany, which I was lucky enough to go to Cambridge. And when I was there, like the brightest people I knew felt no need to demonstrate it. Do you know what I mean? There yeah. was like really people that have extreme intelligence don't feel a need to like show off. And then it's the same when you meet Steve. I mean, he had, there's no sort of talking down to you or because you know, he. When you're that bright, you don't have anything to prove. Um, so I was like, oh, maybe my key is just to pretend I really know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but, but interestingly, as far as someone was talking a bit about the actual doing the science and stuff, and there's that scene when he's writing on the chalkboard, and it's, he was like, how did you play into that? And of course, I don't know that. I don't know what that feels like. But what was amazing about the scene, and something we tried to put in the film but ended up not being in the film, was when he stopped being able to move his hands and write, he came up with this whole new way of thinking, which he described as visualizing. It was basically creating visual references of equations. And um, it was difficult to put that on film, but, but how I then saw that was it's quite artistic, that in some ways it feels like painters going, um, this needs a bit more here or a bit more there. And so when I was trying to do that on the chalkboard, I was trying to relate it to what I know. I'm a very bad painter, but trying to find that <laughs> sense of like what, you know, yeah. what it needs where. Um, I suppose it was the whole. I mean, the most complicated thing was that we didn't shoot chronologically. So oh, within yeah. one day, you were. I mean, our first day of filming, I remember the first scene was Felicity and I young spinning around, and then at lunchtime I was on two walking sticks, and then in the afternoon it was in the second wheelchair, and it was a trial. Every day was like that, and that's unfortunate because you just economically you know, films can't be made. Unless your boyhood, they can't be made. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and so, um, so that was. But I ha I worked for like four months beforehand, and I ended up starting to work with a dancer to try and like, because basically when you when you learn steps of a dance, like it's confusing, and you're kind of trying to work it. But once you know them so well, and your body knows them so well, you can do them without thinking. And I wanted to have all of the elements of the physicality down in different sort of almost like different dances, so that when it came to playing with Felicity, I wasn't thinking about that, or the vocal, or the, you know, you were just playing the human side of it, because that's what the, the story was. And, and similarly, Stephen, when you meet him, couldn't be less interested in the disease. You know, it's entirely secondary to him. I hope that the film's not a film about a disease or a physicality, but that, that's sort of secondary to what is an emotional um, story. Um, but then there was a lot of time in front of a mirror with an iPad, with all of Stephen's <laughs> documentaries on, literally making sure no one was in the room and just sitting in front of the mirror trying to learn to use muscles that you, we don't normally use. I, I didn't watch Ben's. Ben's um, version was directed by a very good friend of mine called Philip Martin as well, and who I adore, and who directed an idea called Birdsong, and Ben is an old friend. And I thought long and hard about it. I'd heard it was phenomenal. And I was like, 
I sort of knew that if I watched it, I'd probably try and steal all his best bits. Do you know? So I, so I stopped myself from watching it, and I still haven't watched it because I thought I'd get through talking about the film before seeing it. But I, I, Ben is an old friend. We were in the other Berlin girl together. Who plays Scarlett Johansson's husband, and um, and I adore him. And I think he's extraordinary. Um, and there was one hilarious moment when we were. Um, we were doing a scene when I go into a, a sort of library room and and I was starting outside and we were shooting it at Harrow School, which is um, a school that Ben went to. And I was there dressed as young Stephen with all the glasses and stuff and they were, the cameras were rolling and they were like cool action and there was this board with like school prizes. Um, you know, I think I can't remember what the a bit wooden board engraved with names, and there my eye level was B Cumberbatch. <laughs> so I took a photo, a selfie on my phone, and me dressed as Stephen and sent it to Ben. <laughs> <laughs> well, I started off by humiliating myself massively by um, being, having spent four months researching him and knowing an uncanny amount about his life, having met his students and his family, and, and, and so I was so nervous. It was literally like meeting your idol. And I and it takes a while for him to communicate now. So there are long pauses, and I'm one of those people that hates silence. And so I basically just like spewed forth information about Stephen Hawking to Stephen Hawking for like <laughs> a good 45 minutes. And eventually he was just looking at me, going, "Really? That you know, tell me about myself?" Um, but I eventually, I eventually sort of calmed down, and he was brilliant. I mean, he he. There were specifics he spoke about, like he asked me if I was playing him before the voice machine, and I said yes, and he said my voice was very slurred, and one of the things we were having is, I wanted to take it to the extremity of what his voice was, there's one documentary material in which you can hear Stephen speaking and he's incomprehensible, um, and his student translates him, and I wanted to get to that stage, but the producers were worried about having subtitles, um, and then Stephen said, could you not have a translator? And so I then took that back to Anthony, who then wrote in the scenes in which Jane translates for, for Stephen a wee bit. And it's not to the full extreme that Stephen got to, because it was it's amazing. amazing. There is a documentary, a BBC Horizons documentary, that is just totally riveting, you see. Um, and but, so that was a specific. But generally what I gleaned was this like humour and mischief and, and, and the wit um, and the smile. Like, he has this extraordinary smile, and when it opens up, you, you just, the world feels like a greater place. Well, the thing that I took away was that you know he, he, they were both given this gigantic obstacle, age 21. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so young, and he was given two years to live, and he says every day beyond that is a gift. And how they chose to defy those obstacles or attempt to overcome those obstacles, I think is what is defining in, in, its, in, it, in its inspirational quality for me. I mean, this idea that with Stephen, he, every minute of every, and a lot of the ALS patients I met, when time suddenly becomes, you know, every day could be the, your last, and that's what you've been believing since the age of 21, and there have been some, you know, as you saw in the film, choking fits, moments of uh, constant, you know, that death is really quite close by in the fact that he lives his life passionately and fully and that Jane similarly did. I mean, there's, is a, is a, it was what I try and take away from it as we, or as I deal with the like, pathetic anxieties of my every day, um, try and remember that. Uh, when he liked it, um, I hadn't realised that from the day that I got the part, which is about a seven month period in total to when he, no, maybe more, almost a year, that, my shoulders had, you know, they'd been attacked, and just there was this sort of, it was really overwhelming, if I'm being honest. And and frankly, that was before people then saw it. And what thrilled me when Jane and Stephen and the family liked it was, I care about their story. I think it's a pretty, mm -hmm. um, I don't want to overuse the word inspiring, because I think it's, it sounds a bit glib, but it's a really, you know, emboldening story. And, um, and I was then, that for me, the idea of now trying to encourage people to go see it, it was really important because I think it's, and so it's actually normally with press things quite often you don't quite know what you're doing or where, and I feel very sort of like I really am thrilled to be able to encourage people to go and check it out. It's totally, and I mean the interesting thing was you had to get into quite a sort of, you had to get into your own headspace because also film sets are really 
manic, frenetic places, then you're having, and everything about Stephen, you know, as the disease progresses, is things like blinking speed and eye speed, and and the fact that you're not, you, you can do that, but it's not that. It's you know, it's learning to sort of really grade all mm. all of all of that sort of thing, and. Um, so it was, and I would, and also you would then, although we were jumping into different parts of the film in the in within the same day. Whenever I was in one physicality, I would try and stay in that for as long as possible. Um, or, or that's Felicity always reminds me of the occasion you have to jump out and need a coffee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I would try and stay there, principally also because you didn't want what the wide shot to be with one thing, and then in the next shot you would see that that's moved. <laughs> you know, it was a sort of continuity aspect as well, but. Um, but there was a. It was also because really what the, the very interesting thing was the less he could move, the more physically exhausting it was. So people go, oh, you're doing so little. Well, no, when his mm -hmm. eyes, when he's not doing anything, it's not his face isn't. It's like these muscles are, are up here, and you're like you're holding them for extended periods, and then trying to access these ones. So and. To, change your breathing pattern and all these things. So what was weird is at the end of each take there'd be a sort of expulsion of because you've actually been controlling all the and it's funny because I see I, for those last two scenes um, of the film when he does the big lecture and then meets the Queen I had prosthetics on and those prosthetics here as well you basically there's no air can't get in so your sweat starts sweating and basically they don't Sweat bubbles, it's revolting, start <laughs> arising in the pit. And they have to be like pricked, and then the sweat comes out. And when I, and that came through like the, because it's like you're, it's like you're in the middle of a hardcore dance doing all that. And I, just, I sort of look at the film and occasionally I can see the odd air bubble, and I'm like, oh, there's the sweat. <laughs> yeah, that's the memory of it. Yeah. Well, I, I basically, I've worked with, so basically you have upper neurons and lower neurons. Okay? Yeah. And when your uppers stop, there is a rigidity. When your lower ones stop, there's a wilting. Now, ALS is a, a combination of those two, and how it manifests itself in each patient is completely unique. So, so you can have, for example, a lower hand and then an upper arm. Do you see what you do? And yeah. so I basically took all the photos, because there's no documentary material of Stephen before the 80s, I took all the photos I could to a specialist, who by looking, for example, at the wedding photo and seeing that his hand is on James, but that it's here, that, and that year, that had gone. Do you see what I'm saying? So tracing yeah. through what that was. And I basically wrote on a big double piece of A3 paper every scene, which muscle was going, where he was vocally, wow. what stick he was in, which chair he was in, which glasses, because all you had to be, so often in film you can then go in the edit and just go, I'm going to put that scene here and that, and I kept saying to James and Anthony, we have to be, this is a disease that once the muscle stops working, doesn't start again. So you can't like <laughs> fling that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, have to be like rigorous.